Hello everyone, I have a treat for you today. I am here with someone who is running to represent Ohio's 11th Congressional District, and not just anybody. I am here with the legend, Senator Nina Turner. Hello, somebody. Senator, welcome to the program. <laughs> Hello, Mike. It is so good to be on the show with you. I have admired you for years. You are one of the best, and I mean one of the best. Oh. progressive firebrands that we have on independent media and i just love you madly i just want everybody to know it i'm just gonna put it out there madly that means so much coming from you and of course the feeling is obviously mutual um i've done so many interviews with congressional candidates politicians um members of congress this is the first one where i'm like genuinely uh, like I'm starstruck almost like it feels surreal because like someone that you look up to so much who has been like your inspiration who like picks you up like to talk to that individual to talk to you it just feels really really nice uh, I'm so excited to pick your brain about so much because you are just like a, a data bank of information so I wanted to ask you, um, I think that everyone who's watching knows what to expect from you from a policy standpoint, but can you just explain like, what made you want to run and continue the fight? And what do you think you would bring that's different from other members of, of Congress? Like, What are your unique attributes that you think you'd contribute? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Mike. And I'm, I am excited to, I mean, we have more progressives in that Congress than we have had over the last 10 to 20 years, that is for sure. And it will be the combination of, of all of our gifts and talents putting it together. I know I'm probably dating myself, but there was a show called The Super Friends, the older, older version, not the real fancy version when I was growing up. And it was the Wonder Twins. And so hopefully somebody that listening can relate to what I'm about to say. But the Wonder Twins, their powers only worked really they were optimized when they were, were together and every time they had to tackle something you know fight a villain it was wonder twin powers activate and so for me that's really how i see myself going into that congress that is not just any one of the progressives or the super progressives <laughs> well we just created a new group here the super progressives but it's 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 the wonder twin powers activate and for me I do bring a righteous indignation. And I think the way that I express, and as a matter of fact, I know the way that I express that righteous indignation is unique. I lean a lot on my proximity to pain and understand, and we all have a story. Everybody that watches you and loves you and listens to you, you know, has a story. Everybody in Congress has a story. Those stories are different. Everybody has a story, but it's how you put that story out there. So my proximity to pain is in full effect. I never want to forget what it's like. I have been in the poor category, the working poor category, and the barely middle class. And I do understand in this unique moment, Mike, we don't have time to waste. And 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 that, you know, I had a I used to work for a, a mayor of the city of Cleveland. He was the second African American mayor elected to the city of Cleveland. And I had the opportunity to serve in his cabinet. And one of the things about serving on the local level of government, so I served in his cabinet and then I also became a city councilwoman. But one of the things that I learned from him is that people have 24 hour, seven day a week problems and challenges. And so I know I'm not the only one that brings local elected experience to that Congress, but I, 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 I live that. I mean, that is part of what makes me me. That experience of both being on the executive side of local government and also on the elected side of local government. But Mayor White used to always say, if your hair is on fire, you ought to act like your hair is on fire. Well, guess what? My hair is on fire. You know why it's on fire? Because too many people in this country are suffering and you have people at the highest offices of the land making excuses as to why we can't push policy to help ameliorate those challenges. So I'm like, I am not going to sit around being prim and proper. I am going to express the requisite amount of passion and outrage. My hair is on fire for the suffering people of this country. And I think that that's exactly why you resonate with so many people, because everyone is feeling it right now. Um, everyone is feeling as if, you know, our heads are over water. We have a limited window to act when it comes to climate change. And nobody's really speaking with the urgency that's necessary for this moment and how severe things are in the country. And I think that the way that you speak to it, it really does 
captivate people. It, it gets them motivated in a way where like it gives us this new perspective where it's okay to be angry and we should be angry. In fact, that's good because we can use that ang anger to propel us to actually take action. Um, so I wanted to ask you because th there's a lot that's going on right now. We just saw the CNN town hall with Joe Biden where he said he wouldn't commit to canceling more than $10,000 worth of student debt. I don't necessarily know that Democrats would be open overall to Medicare for all. We know that Joe Biden wouldn't. So my question for you is in times like this where we don't have people in power that want to push for policies that we desperately need, especially Medicare for all during a pandemic, how do we fight for those types of things? Like, I know that organizing is important, but at the congressional level, like, how do you push for these policies when you have a party that isn't technically the opposition party, but they're in opposition to us? So how do you fight for that in these times? No, we got to continue. I mean, I wish I had a magic wand to, to make it happen automatically. I would definitely do that. They're really... I I want the American people to know that there really is no excuse in a hegemon nation for us to be the only industrialized nation not to push for Medicare for all for our people. Not just push, pass it. Just, just, just flat out pass. It. There really are no excuses for that. So for me, I mean, I, I, I don't have a, a magic wand to, to be able to do with this other than that pushing part is really what we must do. And we have to see the grassroots bubbling up in this country and to continue to be outraged by the fact that, especially as you just said, in a pandemic, that we, the collective we, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, however, this is not about their political leanings. It is about people literally dying and or losing their livelihoods. I don't know what else it takes to move people to Medicare for all. If this pandemic doesn't do it, we have to begin to question our commitment as a nation. So we're saying one thing, and I'm saying we, saying one thing, politicians are saying one thing, but they're actually doing another. You know, during the celebration of MLK, for example, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you got all these people quoting him, but they won't act in the same manner that he would act and that he encouraged all of us to act. Not in moments like this, especially, we know that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. supported, uh, that he that he supported uh, health care. He talked about of all the injustices, you know, all of the things that he has seen, the injustice in health care was one of those. He talked about militarism, materialism, and war. All of these things combined, and not just the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there were other sheroes and heroes that were fighting at all times against the status quo. So what I would say, Michael, is that I don't want us to lose sight of why it is important to push and why the grassroots in this case is even more important than who is in the Congress and in the White House, because all of the great changes, social justice type changes that have ever happened in this country have come from everyday people putting a little extra on their ordinary so that extraordinary things can happen. That's one part. Of. The other part of it is that taking that righteous indignation and that anger to the ballot box at all times, making a demand and making sure that there are consequences to those demands, those things work in concert. So electing progressives on all levels of government, not just the Congress, and then making sure that there's a consequence for people not acting on the things that we need. That is how the change is going to come. There is no other way for that change to come but the bubbling up of the grassroots and having people in elected office who actually care more about the next generation than they care about their next election. We got to do it. There's, there's no other way that change happens. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point. I mean, that that really does make a lot of sense. There's no real accountability mechanism in the United States. Like Joe Biden, for example, can say, I'm not going to cancel more than 10,000. And really, all we can do is vocalize anger and outrage. But there's no like political mechanisms at this moment. You know, most Democrats, maybe they disagree with him. Maybe they agree with him, but they're, they're not going to really hold him accountable in a meaningful way. So that's why I think it's really important that we do, you know, institute these types of strategies where we bring together the grassroots and we also build that block in Congress. Um, I, I did want to get your take on uh, members of the squad. So rightly or wrongly, people have been feeling a little bit demoralized because they feel as if the squad doesn't necessarily push back 
on Democratic Party leadership enough. And I wanted to get your take on this because I do feel a little bit uh, mixed on this. On one hand, they are the only members who ever push back on leadership in the Democratic Party, but perhaps they could be more forceful. Uh, perhaps they could, you know, uh, choose to fight even more battles with them. What is your take on this? Because I think it's really complicated because on one hand, the members of the Democratic Party have a lot of institutional power and they could use their power to really silence and suppress, you know, these progressives. But at the same time, um, it's frustrating because there's so much that's at stake, so many people suffering who want Medicare for all, uh, student debt cancellation, that, you know, the, this, the standards are really high for members of the squad. So what is your take in terms of like how you think they're faring as members of the squad and whether or not your approach would differ in comparison with theirs to Democratic Party leadership in particular? Mike, you are, you're right. It is complicated. That's the first thing I need the grassroots to understand, especially progressives. And I know progressives are disappointed. I mean, we tried 2016, 2020. I get it. So for me as, as a leader, not just somebody elected, because there are things that I can do in committee, things I can do on the floor of the Congress, but there's also things that I can do in my community and also across this country. So don't I want to say don't be disappointed. You got to have some understanding. It's okay to be disappointed, but the the squad is the is 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 ultimately the best that we have in terms of being able to push an agenda. And what that means is that you might not always agree with the methods. I need people to understand that when you are on the inside it doesn't mean that you are selling out. I, I know they, they've gotten a lot of pressure, but they are the ones up there holding it down. They, they're, they're pushing as hard as they can. And just because things are not going exactly the way, just because they're not using a, the exact tactics that some in the activist community want them to use, that doesn't mean that you throw them away. Because guess what? If you're throwing away members of the squad, who are our best opportunity to get what we need and also me some members of that progressive caucus, then you're not gonna have anybody there. So if the prerequisite in summation, if the prerequisite for relationship means that I have to do or the squad has to do everything you say, the way you say do it, then there's not much of a relationship at all. And 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 that you're gonna be disappointed. Hell, they're gonna be disappointed with me. I, I said that to Tim Black when we interviewed. I'm saying it to you, Mike. I want them to know you're going to be disappointed at some point. But that does not mean that you give up totally on the people who are the best fighting chance that you have. And then there's something called strategy. So the grassroots strategy is different than the strategy once you are on the inside. You will know when somebody is sold out. And I assure you that the squad has not, underline, bold, underscore, sold out in any way. They need the grassroots. You can hold hold them accountable, but you don't throw them away. I mean, some of the pressures, even with Congresswoman Cori Bush, I would just want to use her as the example. I mean, she just got there. Hell, overall, the squad members overall just got there, even the ones who've been there a little longer. And then you have people just throwing up their hands throwing them away just because they're not using the taxes that you want them to use. You don't know what is going on. And so part of the thing that I want to do outside of what I do, and I'm claiming this on the floor of the, of the House of Representatives and also as a member of committee, is to also continue to educate and bring people. I just want people to see it different ways to get understanding. Stephen, Stephen Covey, one of the most world-renowned leadership gurus, has a quote that I love. He said, speak first to understand and then to be understood. That doesn't mean we're always agree, but at least let's give each other enough bandwidth to understand. And for the love of God, do not throw away, malign the squad members. It doesn't mean you're not going to be disappointed, but to throw them away is, is, is at our own peril. It really is. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I, I think that there's a difference between holding members of Congress accountable and completely like disregarding them, um, relegating them to like the trash bin as if they're useless. It, it doesn't necessarily seem like a lot has changed because from a policy standpoint, like what's being codified into law hasn't. But at the same time, when you look at what these individual members of Congress have managed to accomplish, it is substantial. And I get that there is a lot that needs to be done. But I mean, 
Ilhan Omar single-handedly introduced one of the most important bills, canceling all student loan debt. Cori Bush is one of the only members of Congress I've ever heard in a direct way talk about reparations. That's really significant. That's something that hasn't happened, at least since I've been alive. And so, there, like, to me, I understand, like, cause for disappointment because things need to happen fast. And it's not happening fast enough. And so what I think that we have to do is hold the right people accountable. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you give members of the squad a, a pass and other progressive members of Congress, Pramila Jayapal, who introduced Medicare for All. But it does mean that we need to direct our anger towards better people, uh, individuals on committees who are absolutely obstacles to progress. You know, Richie Neal, for example, uh, individuals in leadership who are very directly blocking the things that we want to get accomplished. And so, like, I think that it's important for you to say that to put things into perspective, because I totally agree with what you're saying. You know, there are times where I disagree with the strategy of members of the squad, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what they're doing is bad or they've sold out, as, as you stated, because when you're in Congress, things are so different because there's so much pressure. I think that Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said it best that like the minute you get in there, you are bombarded with all of these voices in your head, you know, of people trying to influence you in a certain way. And so it does change things. It changes the way that you behave, you know, when you are an activist, an organizer and a member of Congress. But that doesn't necessarily mean that these folks have lost sight of what's important. And I think that that is um, important to say. Did you want to add to that? Yeah. I, I did, uh, Mike. That is exactly right. And God, I, it is the pain is palpable in this country, and it's been so for a very long time. Oh my God, do I get it? And, and, and that is why I express such righteous indignation because I, I know, you know, as I traveled this country, I certainly had the opportunity to to talk to people, to touch people, to. To, to listen to their hopes, their dreams, and their fears, and, and the struggle is real even before the, the, the pandemic. But we all have a role to play. The members that we elect to Congress have a role to play, and we, the people, have a role to play, too. And I want folks to know that and, and just kind of own that, that space and keep pushing and fighting because that is ultimately what is going to get us to where we need to be in this country. And the progressive movement has to be more organized and more agile, and we got to stop the circular firing squad that I am seeing. You know, I mean, just by way of an example, you know, I tweeted Black History Month, tweeted something that President Barack Obama said, and I can't tell you the numbers of people who were, we're disappointed, we're mortified. I walked, with, I marched with her in Philadelphia, you know, just, I ain't even got the Congress, and they already throwing, away, throwing me away just because I gave a quote from President Barack Obama, who I did not agree with at, at all times, but I'm not about to throw him away either. And so I, people need to focus on the main things, and the main things are to continue to elect progressives who have bold policies, who will stand up, and who will fight on the inside, coupled with, not separate from, but coupled with a grassroots bubbling up that will never go away. That is what, that's, that's what we need. The grassroots can never go away because that's how we're going to get this change. People can't lose sight of it. Like, I know people are disappointed, mad as hell, and suffering like hell, too. I get it. But by God. And you know what? You gave those examples about the, the various pieces that have been introduced from, from Medicare for All with Congresswoman Daya Paul all the way to Congresswoman Cori Bush on reparations, which I will be joining her in that choir. But you know what? That $15 an hour minimum wage is on the House side. And you know why it's there? It's because the Congressional the Progressional, the Progressive Caucus, along with the squad, wouldn't let up on it. It's there. And it's probably most likely going to pass on the House side. Now we got to go over there and do the fight on the Senate side. So we are making strong gains. We are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that it's really, really important to like, keep things into perspective where we are now is i think entirely different than where we were five years ago for example uh, i think that the overton window has shifted largely because of the grassroots because of members of the squad and to talk about things like single-payer health care and reparations 
I mean, that, that really is in and of itself a victory. And I get that this is all rhetoric and it's not the same thing as actually like getting this pass, but it still does matter talking about these things that were basically not acceptable to even discuss. Uh, it matters to talk about socialism versus capitalism to even criticize capitalism is a different thing for america so we are changing it's not just the political change that we're going through i also think it's somewhat cultural as well where members of american society are starting to kind of wake up and realize hey in comparison with our neighbors north of the border canada we're kind of getting a bad deal when it comes to health care we shouldn't have to pay monthly for health care that we don't like that doesn't cover everything that doesn't protect us from bankruptcy so i am i am starting to see things change is it fast enough of course not but the fact that we're making progress and we're moving in the correct direction you know it is important and sometimes i get down and i forget about that but really just comparing to what this country looked like it, it is moving in a better direction um and i think that largely members of the squad and the grassroots and constant pressure on the democratic party establishment is what's responsible for that i did want to ask you about one thing um usually members who run for congress i always ask them this question the legislation unfortunately hasn't been introduced for this term as of yet it was previously hr 4000 it's called the fair representation act by don byers jr and basically this in my opinion is really the first step in getting electoral reform in the United States. So what this would do is a couple of things. It would introduce ranked choice voting um, nationwide, which I think is really important. Um, it also would end gerrymandering and it would move us towards a more proportional system. So that way, rather than all of us having just one representative in Congress, maybe we have two or three so that folks who uh, traditionally wouldn't have representation actually get someone in Congress fighting for them. Would you be open to supporting something like this? Or if it's not reintroduced, perhaps like elevating this as an issue? Because for me, I, I do support initiatives like the For the People Act, um, H.R. 1 in Congress that the Democratic Party has uh, introduced in the Senate and the House. But I do think we need to go further. And I just wanted to get your take on this type of legislation and whether or not you'd support it. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Uh, you know, it, it's it's hard to get members of Congress who have been there for a really long time to uh, support something like ranked choice voting that might op open the door to like third and fourth parties, because that very deliberately will diminish the amount of power that they have. So it, it's kind of hard to like get someone to support something that technically isn't in their self-interest as a politician. But what I love about this new generation of members of Congress is that they're not running for self-aggrandizing reasons. They're not careerists. Like, they want to help people. And so these are the individuals, members of the squad yourself, who I think we have a real opportunity to actually, like, get this on the agenda or at least talk about it, which is important. Another thing that I really want to ask you about is... The anti-war movement that's lacking in this country, both at a grassroots level, but a congressional level, I, I think that there are some members of Congress who really deserve a lot of praise, uh, such as Ro Khanna, for example. What is your take? Like, what do you think is the missing factor? Like, why is it that Democrats at large, not necessarily members of the squad, why are they comparable to Republicans in the early 2000s? Like, why has the issue of war not really moved much when we are making progress on other progressive issues, in your opinion? Two things. One is the donor class, or the owner class. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes I can't tell the difference, <laughs> right? The owner donors. I call them the owner donors. That, that's accurate. <laughs> and two, which is why we need that ranked choice and other other changes to our electoral system. We, we got to have those things changed. And just one point before I directly answer that question, the diminishment, diminishing the power of whom, because people who are elected to office, whether it's the Congress or a dog catcher in this country, if you are elected, you are holding the people's power. And every single day, those of us who are privileged enough to hold the people's power should be doing things that edify and lift the people and not ourselves. And so if we are afraid to make systemic change because we think it's going to diminish our individual power, but then we're we're in the elected ministry for the wrong reasons. And I do call it a ministry because I do believe that you ought to love that. You cannot serve that which you do not love. And that is another reason why I wear my righteous indignation. But to your point um, about war, so one is the owner donor, so we need campaign finance reform, stat, the owner donors, because that gets in the way of every other thing that we care about. Every other thing that we are pushing is tied to that. That's why I'm a part of America's Promise. You know, uh, campaign finance, that that whole reform.
reform effort. And then I'm also involved with some groups uh, that are standing up against war. Now, Drop the Mic is a project that I've been working on with the very old Ben Cohen, Minister of Ice Cream himself, one of the co-founders of Ben & Jerry's. And he has been, for the last 30 years, pushing us to understand that if we are pouring, what, almost 60%, a little less than 60% of our discretionary budget goes to the military-industrial complex, that same money, what is it, about $720 billion would it be, could be going towards more domestic needs, be it education, be it health care, name the domestic needs, that money could be going there. We have to understand that our strength, and we need the American people. Look, we're going to be strong. We, 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 we put more money in the military-industrial complex than the next seven to ten uh, industrialized nations combined. So we have to have a paradigm shift of what it means to be strong. It's not war. We, we can't World War Three or anything similar to it is annihilation. So all of us, it is in our best interest to demand that our elected officials, be they Democrats or Republicans, see strength in a different way. It's strong to educate your citizens in this country from pre-K to college or vocational school. It's strong to have Medicare for all. It's strong to uh, cancel all student debt in this country. It's strong to make sure that our essential workers, our frontline workers, uh, have hazard pay and to make that demand. It's strong to increase the minimum wage. I mean, all of, how do we see and interpret strength? That is it, Mike. And that one issue right there is never going to change unless the grassroots put the heat on the people they elect. Beautifully put. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to give you the opportunity to let my viewers know what is it that you need from us to make sure that we get you in Congress? Because I know that it's easy to get complacent because you're a rock star, but we still have to fight. It's not going to be an easy battle. What do you need from us? Not at all. I mean, I'm being attacked already. So I, I need the grassroots. I need progressive time, talent, treasure. They can go to ninaturner.com where they can sign up to volunteer. They can also donate. Our average donation fluctuates between $26 and $28. I think we're back at that magical $27. <laughs> Oh my God, it is such a beautiful thing. We 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 are we have raised money from all over this country. In my home state of Ohio, we're well at twenty five thousand, you know, people in the great state of Ohio or donors in, in the state donating to this campaign. I need, we need, this campaign needs, because it's not just about me, it's about I'm running, but I know I'm the tool, I'm a conduit. But beyond the eleventh congressional district and serving my constituents who will Hopefully send me to that Congress. I know by extension what makes my district strong is is also what makes will make the rest of the country strong. It's the movement. So for me, Mike, it is not it's, it's, it's my district, but it's also continuing to add to this robust, powerful, beautiful, rambunctious movement that we have that will get us the change that we need. So time, talent, treasure, go to NinaTurner.com. Donate $3, $2, even $1 will help our campaign. And if you can, volunteer. There are volunteer ships to make calls or to text. Please do that. And you will help us go to Congress. And I, I'm taking the poor, the working poor, and the barely middle class to those calls with me, starting with the great people of the 11th Congressional District who will send me there. And by extension, all of our sisters and brothers who believe enough in this campaign and our movement and our mission to donate to this campaign. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Senator Turner, it has been an absolute pleasure. I hope that I can bring you on again sometime soon. If not, hopefully the next time I speak to you, you will be a member of Congress. Either way, we are going to fight like hell to make sure that this happens. Hello, somebody. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Hello, somebody. It was my hot honor, and I look forward to joining you again.